You'll find our scripture reading for this evening in Revelation chapter 4, beginning at verse 1 and reading through to the end of chapter 5. Revelation chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white <coughs> excuse me, and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits in the throne and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits in the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat in the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the line of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. <clears throat> he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a heart, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. 
the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Now we are turning back to these two chapters in the book of Revelation, which we've just read together a moment ago in our service as we are making our way through the book of Revelation. We've come to chapters 4 and 5, which we are going to look at together this evening. Sometime in the early 1960s, there was a Christian bookshop somewhere north of St. George's Tron, I think perhaps in a street now demolished, and probably some large building stands in its place. I want you to imagine yourself, some of you almost incapable of imagining the early 60s, they weren't too long ago. I want you to imagine a young teenager making his way rather gingerly into that shop, wondering what kind of strange people he might encounter. Would they pounce from behind one of the bookcases to sell him a book that he didn't want to buy. But eventually relaxing and looking through the bookcases with his little half crown in his pocket. Yes, I am that boy. My whole pocket money. I had walked into town on a drich Saturday afternoon and I was going to spend my two and sixpence on a Christian book. And my eye espied a book with a magnificent eagle on the front cover, as I remember, J.B. Phillips' translation of the book of Revelation. And I thought to myself, there is my Saturday afternoon reading today, this drich afternoon. I took it home. I didn't have enough money left to get the bus home. I can't remember what a bus fare cost in those days, but I walked home. And I sat, I remember, somewhat huddled over the fire that afternoon. And I began to read this modern translation of the book of Revelation. And found myself unable to put it down until I'd finished the entire book. I suppose I was 14 or 15 years old. I'm sure I didn't know all the possible interpretations there were of the book of Revelation. But it has convinced me over the decades that have followed that you don't need to fuss with all the interpretations that people unearth of the book of Revelation to understand its central message. Its central message is, if I can put it in the vernacular, Jesus wins, okay. Jesus wins, okay. But Jesus wins as the book of Revelation unfolds with these marvelous pictures, these mighty armies, these gargantuan creatures as one after another moves through the eye of your imagination. Jesus wins in a world that seems so often to be set against him. And obviously the book of Revelation written towards the end of the first century, experienced by the Apostle John, when he was suffering greatly for the cause of Jesus Christ as an exile on the island of Patmos. The story of Jesus winning at the end of history is a story that is told in the book of Revelation to assure Christians in the first century and in every century since that Jesus will win at the end of history because Jesus is now reigning throughout the whole of history. And the reason why early on in this apocalypse, this unveiling of the victory of Jesus, John is given this amazing experience of being caught up in the Spirit and seeing a door open into heaven and is invited to step, as it were, momentarily out of earth into heaven is in order to help him to understand that if we are going to be one of those described in chapters 2 and 3 as overcomers, if we are going to be what Paul calls in Romans chapter 8, those who are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us, that is, through Jesus Christ. We have got to learn to look at the world through properly focused lenses. And that means we need to learn to look at history from a heavenly and not an earthly perspective. And we need to look at the trials and tribulations of the church and of our own selves as individual Christians, not from self outwards, but from God downwards. And these two chapters, in a sense, are following on what Bill Dunlop was saying this morning. Are Jesus saying to the Apostle John and through him to us, come up here for a minute and see what it looks like from my point of view. Those of us who were here this morning when Bill Dunlop was preaching on Hebrews chapter 1, you remember how he put it? When Jesus is exalted at the right hand of the Father, the Father is saying to him, come and sit here. And here in the book of Revelation, it is as though Christ is saying to John, John, for a moment at least in your life, at least for one Lord's day in your life, come and sit here and see what it looks like from our point of view. And then go and live the rest of your life as a man who sees earth from the heavenly perspective and sees earthly things from a heavenly perspective. And when that has begun to take hold of us as it took hold of the Apostle John, there is no doubt whatsoever we can never, ever, ever be the same man, the same woman again. Our world is turned upside down or better turned the right way up because we become conscious of the certainty of the triumph of our glorious God. And that is really what these two chapters are about. The book of Revelation is about the victory of Jesus. And these two chapters are about what that victory looks like from heaven's point of view. The rest of the book of Revelation in different ways is taken up with the struggle of the church on earth. But the struggle of the church on earth, the whole of the New Testament teaches, is not a struggle eventually to victory, but a struggle that is based on an already accomplished victory by Jesus Christ. And it is from that perspective of the triumph and the glory of Jesus Christ that the Christian is able to live his or her life. And it's that that begins to put a different melody into our Christian lives. Whether we are those who are struggling onwards in the hope that one day Jesus will win a victory, or whether we are those who are looking forward to the final victory of Christ in the knowledge that he has already secured that victory, and that Jesus already reigns okay. Now, it's not at all difficult to look at these two chapters and to simplify what the Apostle John is seeing. The first and the great thing, obviously, that his mind and his eyes are drawn towards, we might call the focus of his vision. And you'll notice immediately he tells us where it is. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Verse 2, at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven. And all of the action of these two chapters takes place around this area of the throne. And like a tapestry, which the book of Revelation really is, John's eyes are drawn at one moment to this part of the vision, at another moment to another part of the vision. And as he looks around these different parts of the tapestry, he begins to see that they all make sense only in the light of what stands at the very center of the tapestry. And that is this throne that is set in heaven itself, and which 
he has begun to see in the power of the Holy Spirit. He looks around, he is in exile, things are going badly for some of the little house churches with which he's associated, and he wonders what God is doing. A little like Isaiah when he stumbles into the temple in the year that King Uzziah died and everything seemed to be falling to pieces spiritually and nationally. And God said to him as he said to John, come up here my child for a moment and see that there is a throne set in heaven and learn the lessons of the throne that is at the center of heaven's glory. And as he begins to look, John sees a number of things. He sees, first of all, that this throne is occupied. There is a figure seated upon the throne. It is none other than God the Father. There before me, verse 2, was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And he begins to describe what he saw. And in this picture that he sees, God is reminding him of certain things. Think for a moment of the symbolism that is represented here. What is there above this one who is seated upon the throne? Well, we are told a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. And what comes from within the throne? Verse 5 From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. These are things that make sense to the Apostle John because he is deeply steeped in the story of God's work and his revelation in the Old Testament Scriptures. There is only one thing of which a rainbow reminds him, and that is the great covenant that God made with Noah that he would preserve the earth and never again destroy it with this kind of flood. And these rumbles of thunder, these flashes of lightning, they immediately remind John of that monumental occasion when Moses ascended Mount Sinai and there was given the tablets of stone with which God was pledging himself to his people and calling his people to be his children and his servants. And he's catching a sense of who this is who is seated on the throne. This is the God who committed himself in covenant to Noah and has kept that covenant, who committed himself in covenant to Moses and has kept that covenant even although the people broke it. Indeed, he is more than that, as these strange creatures tell us in verse 8. He is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Words that are reminiscent of the revelation that was also given to Moses. When Moses said, what am I going to say to the people when they say, what is the name of this God for whose sake you come? And God said to him out of the burning bush, tell them, I am who I am. I am the one who is out without beginning of days or end of days, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, who was and who is and who is to come. And all of these little elements in this centerpiece of the tapestry to which John's eyes have been drawn in heaven are saying to him, John, the throne of heaven is occupied by a God who has shown his absolute faithfulness to his people down through the centuries, down through the millennia. Indeed, he is the one, you will notice, he is described in these terms in verse 11, who created all things and by whom all things presently have their being. He is the one who brought things into being, who preserves all things, who makes his covenant with his people and who is utterly faithful to all of his promises. He is, as John discovers here again in verse 8, the one who is infinitely holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty 
who was and who is and who is to come. The throne is occupied by this great covenant-making, covenant-keeping Heavenly Father. But John sees not only that the Father is seated on the throne, he sees then that the Spirit is before the throne. Verse 5, From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits, or the sevenfold spirit of God. Where is this spirit picture? The spirit he saw, he says, was before the throne. In other words, in some sense, in order to approach the throne, in order to be near the presence of the one who is on the throne, it is necessary for one to get there through the Spirit. Probably John sees these seven spirits or this sevenfold spirit because God is communicating to him by the use of this number seven so often used in the Bible, the sense of completeness. Seven is often said, and I think rightly in Scripture, frequently to be the number that indicates wholeness and completeness. And what John seems to be receiving by way of revelation here is the notion that if he sees God the Father seated on the throne as the sovereign one, the Spirit who brings him into contact with the Father, into fellowship with the Father, is the Spirit whose great task is to bring to completion the work which the Father begins. And as you read through Scripture, you frequently discover that's what the Holy Spirit does. God brings the world into being. The Father breathes. He speaks His Word and a universe comes into being. But then we are told in Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God comes, as it were, like a bird figure brooding over the waters, and He brings light out of darkness and order out of the apparent chaos. He is the one who brings to completion, who puts the finishing touches to the work that the Father does. We could say the same thing about the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Father's decision to send His Son. God the Father so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But how is the Son brought into this world? He is brought into this world. Do you remember the Christmas story? Because the Spirit of God, as He had done at the beginning of creation, hovered over the womb of the Virgin Mary. And in that similar darkness, she conceived the infant Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. An event as mysterious as the creation of the world out of nothing in the beginning. And then you read the rest of the New Testament. What do you discover? You discover that Jesus has died in order to bring forgiveness of sins and new life to all who will trust in him. But Jesus, the New Testament says, died and was raised and now has gone back into heaven. How will he do this? He sends the sevenfold spirit, the spirit who brings the workmanship of God to completion. And the Spirit of God works in our hearts to bring us to faith in Christ, works in our lives to transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ. And indeed the New Testament says, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that on the last day when Jesus comes to claim this world for his own, it is the Holy Spirit who will energize the mortal bodies of men and women and make them new again. And all this is portrayed before John's eyes. It's almost as though he is seeing the whole message of the Bible in a few snapshots given to him, in a few pieces of tapestry that are woven before him by God. 
But then there is something else for him to look at. The Father is the figure seated on the throne. The sevenfold Spirit is the one who is before the throne. And then he sees something else. The Lamb who is at the center of the throne. And it's wonderful to see the dramatic way in which this is woven into the tapestry. His eyes are moving from the center to see the Spirit before the throne. And then his eyes move back into the center again. Chapter 5, verse 1. And you notice how the camera zooms in now. Hollywood, everything Hollywood, Spielberg, and the rest of them ever learned about making movies, they could learn from the Bible. The camera focuses in on this great figure seated on the throne, and now it focuses in on one part, as it were, of the divine anatomy, on the hand of God. He hadn't noticed it the first time. The glory of the one seated on the throne was just so amazing that he he couldn't take it in. He couldn't stare at it. He couldn't see the detail. But now his eye is drawn to a detail. And he sees, now he's gone down the arm and he sees the hand of God there on the throne. It looks as though he's holding something out. What is he holding out? And John tells us, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides. And it was sealed with seven seals. That is to say, it really was sealed. It was perfectly sealed. And he's intrigued by this. And then the tapestry seems to come alive. He hears a voice saying, is there anyone who is able to break open these seals and to open up the scroll? And to bring to pass what's written in this scroll. And there is at least momentarily dead silence. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Of course they couldn't look inside it because they couldn't break the seals. They weren't fit to break the seals. I wonder if you've ever wept when you've been having a dream. Sometimes that happens to people. The the dream is so real and tense that they wake up and they know they've been crying. And here is John caught up in this vision. And in a way all his attention is taken up with the object of his vision. But he's also conscious that somehow or another he's in it. He's part of this great drama. And he begins to weep. His whole being seems to begin to heave with emotion because he recognizes the significance of this scroll. As we shall do as we read through the rest of the book of Revelation, which unfolds from this scroll. It's the scroll of God's purposes for the salvation of his people, the judgment of the world, and the restoration of heaven and earth. And John weeps because there is no one who is worthy to open the scroll or even look inside. And then one of these elders who was around the throne comes to him. You can almost see them. Sometimes you see the elders here at communion and something's not going right and one of them will nudge the other and an elder will get up and he'll attend to it. It's almost as though people actually begin to step out of this tapestry. And an elder comes to him and puts a comforting hand upon him and says to him, John, don't weep. John's head begins to come up, don't weep. Look, look, says the elder, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And John now looks back at this moving tapestry to see this mighty figure of the lion of the tribe of Judah who can do what no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is strong enough or worthy enough to do. And when he looks, he tells us in one of the great moments of the book of Revelation, in verse 6, I looked and I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures, And the elders with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And the Lamb was standing 
looking as if it had been slain. The lamb is alive, but it bears all the marks of having been at one time a sacrificial lamb. And it doesn't need any imagination to work out what he's seeing here. He is seeing one of the great biblical symbols for our Lord Jesus Christ. The Passover lamb whose sacrifice averts the angel of death. The sacrificial lamb over whom the people confess their sins. And the lamb is slain and its blood shed for their pardon. And John catches sight of this one he thought would be a mighty lion. And he discovers to his amazement that what he sees is a lamb. That the way in which God is going to bring his purposes in history to pass, the way in which God is going to overcome the powers that shackle men and women, the way in which God is going to vanquish the powers of darkness, is not by apparent strength, but by apparent weakness. Not by apparent victory, but apparent defeat. Not by a lion, the king of the jungle, but by a slain, sacrificial lamb. And here's the secret. Here's the mystery of the book of Revelation in a nutshell. The reason the lamb looks as though it has a death mark on it is because this is the lamb who has fought with the serpent, whom we shall later see appearing in the guise of a dragon, and had a death blow from that serpent. But in that death blow, has overcome him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and is able to free from their lifelong fear of death all those who have been in bondage to him. It is as Paul had earlier said, by the weak things, by the foolish things, that God breaks the powerful things and confounds the wisdom of men by a lamb slain, by one, you remember, whom Isaiah saw would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, upon whom the chastisement to bring us peace would fall and with whose stripes we would be healed, led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, he did not open his mouth but it pleased the Lord to bruise him in order that he might not have to bruise you and me. Now, there's something else John sees. That's the focus of his vision. But there is something else he sees, and I want us to take a moment this evening to understand what it is. He has seen the one who is seated on heaven's throne, the Spirit of God by whom alone we are able to approach God's throne, the Lamb of God who alone is able to bring us into the saving purposes of God that we may have fellowship with him at that throne. But mingled with all this out of the corner of his eye, John has seen not only the focus of his vision, but he's begun to see the response of the whole of creation. He sees around the throne these four strange creatures and then these 24 elders probably representing the church in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes and the church in the New Testament, the 12 apostles. And then he sees crowding around the throne innumerable angels and then even beyond that he sees the whole of creation or at least distant though they must have seemed to him to be in this momentary tapestry, he hears the whole of creation. What are they doing? Well, it's obvious what they're doing. 
They're worshiping. They're proclaiming God's glory in his holiness and in his majesty. They're singing Christ's praises for the work of redemption. Do you notice it's a very amazing thing and it may not really be significant. But in the Bible when angels are given voices they tend to speak rather than to sing. And even here when they praise God for his holiness and for his work of creation they're able to speak. They speak poetry. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty in verse 8. You are worthy, our Lord and God, in verse 11. But then when they see God's ultimate purposes beginning to be consummated in the Lamb who was slain, they can't speak any longer. They've got to move into a different kind of gear. They've got to start singing. Speech on its own isn't enough for them to express the praises of God and they begin to employ this heavenly music. Some people speak that way, don't they? You sometimes hear people say about people who come from the West, Western Islands or from, from the North, they say his accent's like music. And here the angels' accents move from speech to music. Why? Because they've got something that they can't just say. They've got to sing it. That their king, their head, their lord, their master, the center of heaven's glory, the object of their devotion throughout all the days since their creation has come down to planet earth, has died a cruel death on the cross and been raised again in order to bring salvation to men and women like ourselves. There's not an angel in God's heaven can understand that. There's not an angel who can work out the logic of that better than you or I can work out the logic. There's only one logic to it. It is because he loved us. And he loved us because he loved us. And he loved us just because he loves us. And they burst with the praises of their Lord and our Savior. In a loud voice they sing, verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And one of the wonderful things is this, that here was the Apostle John exiled from the little group of believers with whom he ordinarily worshipped. He'd spent many years in Ephesus. He would be in Ephesus again after this. He loved to go and be with the believers. When he was an old man, the tradition of the church says, in two weeks to speak, they would carry him into the assembly and all he would be able to say would be, my little children love one another. But he wanted to be in that assembly, the assembly in Ephesus, because he had a sense that it was possible if you were in the Spirit on the Lord's Day in Ephesus or in Patmos to begin to experience this kind of thing in worship, to begin to be caught up to the place where real worship is offered, heavenly worship is offered. And to sense that the curtain between our worship and their worship is so exceedingly thin when the Spirit comes upon his people that it's possible to overhear the worship of heaven as we gather for the worship of earth. And when you have entered into that, you have ceased to be a spectator worshiper and become a true spiritual worshiper. Such the Father seeks to worship him, says Jesus, who worship him in the spirit and in reality. My dear friends, this is the most important thing in all the world. If you've tasted it, you know that. If you've tasted even a fragment of this glory in worship, 
when heaven has come down and that glory has filled your soul, you're a restless man or woman for the rest of your days until you can taste it again or until you taste it fully and finally in the glory of heaven. It's the most important thing in your life. It is the balm of true fellowship. And it is one of Christ's most powerful weapons in the great evangelistic enterprise by which in grace he is subduing men and women and boys and girls at his footstool and making them humble, believing worshippers. I've told some of you before, I think, that on one occasion many years ago, I accidentally stumbled into a service of the Orthodox Church. I opened a door in a place where I thought I was going to speak. And as I opened the door, this very tall Greek Orthodox priest was striding down the aisle, huge censer in hand, swinging it in my direction. The room was full of smoke. It was physically an astonishing experience. I'd expected to see a crowd of young people there waiting to hear me speak. I saw this brilliantly garbed priest coming towards me. And I was so shocked, I immediately shut the door. And as soon as I shut the door, I thought to myself, did I really see that? Or was I just imagining things? There's a sense, my friends, in which that's how worship is supposed to be. Back down to earth. Back into the world. But with totally different eyes. Because your eyes, like Isaiah's, have seen the King. The Lord of hosts. And as Paul says, when a stranger comes into our midst and experiences that, he will fall, she will fall, at least inwardly, on his or her face, and say, Surely, God is in the midst of you. Heavenly Father, in our hearts we long to move from earth to heaven, and now from heaven to earth. And we pray as we are conscious of the wonder of that revelation you gave to your beloved servant John. And as we remember how dearly our Lord Jesus loved him, we are not surprised that he chose John to see these things. We confess that we are not worthy to taste or see such things, but you are gracious and merciful. And we pray that in our worship here, in our personal worship on our own, we may see and experience things that eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man to understand, but that God has revealed to those who love him. Make this real for us, we pray. And if, Lord, this is a distant memory for us, or an unknown experience, work in us this very night and make it real. For Jesus' sake. Amen.